Welcome to the eighth episode of the Terp Talk Young Terps podcast presented by Viner Consulting. This is your host, Mason the Intern Viner. And your co-host, Jordan Viner. And today on the Young Terp podcast, we will be talking about Maryland at Wisconsin and Maryland home against Indiana. And then we'll give you guys a preview into what the Maryland football players are doing this NFL preseason. Should be exciting. I know the Maryland rookies aren't doing as much, but we have some... Strangely enough, Maryland vets that are doing good work in the NFL preseason. And that's just something interesting that not many of the Maryland football fans that aren't big fans know is that there are a lot of Terps this year in the NFL preseason. Yeah, there's 21, which is more than there were last year. And the weird thing is a lot of them are fringe players like A.J. Francis who have just been kicked around the league for a while, but they're still here and they're still doing work. I mean, that's how you got to live as an NFL player, especially once you get past your first three years. So, moving on into it, Maryland at Wisconsin. So, Maryland Wisconsin, they seem to play Wisconsin a lot. Let's start there. It just, since we joined the Big Ten, we seem to play Wisconsin almost every year. Yeah, they played them in the first season of the Big Ten, which was 2014, then again in 2015, and now this year, 2017. Yeah, it just, it's not a good person to be paired up with, but, you know. I mean, Maryland seems to come in right into the Big Ten football and get the teeth of the Big Ten. They played Wisconsin. They, of course, have to play the Big Ten East teams every year. Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan. It's just, it's not easy. Well, everybody knew this, but I think the Terps have actually been more successful than a lot of people thought they would have been in their first in their first three years making two bowl games. The last time Maryland played Wisconsin, it was a near huge upset. Maryland only lost by seven points. Yeah, they had a huge comeback going. And I remember they kicked an onside kick. Sean Davis, who's going to be later mentioned in this podcast because he's now in the NFL, picked up the onside kick, ran it back for a touchdown, but the Terps were offside, so it got called back, and then they didn't get the onside kick, and then they lost. Yeah, it's a very Maryland way to lose, though. you got to give them that. So Wisconsin is all about continuity, as, as we all know. Yeah, the last 10 years or so, Wisconsin has been consistently good, consistently good at running the ball and playing defense, and that's just what they do. They're an old-school football team, and the thing with Wisconsin, though, is they're consistently just good enough. They don't ever seem to actually win anything, you know what I mean? Yeah, last year they did win a New Year's Six Bowl game against Western Michigan. They won the Cotton Bowl, but, but still, they had chances against Ohio State and Michigan, and they lost both of those games. They could have been in the college football playoff but it just seems like every year they lose those two games to Ohio State, Michigan, whoever the Big Ten powers are. Yeah, and for those of you who remember, even when they make it to the Rose Bowl, as they did with Russell Wilson in, I believe, 2011, they lost in the last play of the game to Oregon. They just can never just get it close enough. But they have to trouble against Maryland, as we've seen the last two times. Well, in 2015, they had a little bit of trouble, but before that, I mean, they destroyed Maryland in Camp Randall the first time, I believe, by the score of 51-7. to And Stephon Diggs scored really late in that game. And that was one of the few Maryland games in my Terp fan time that I was just done. I just went outside to play football while the game was still going on. Yeah, that was an ugly game. It was a bruising game. But that's just how Wisconsin plays. They will grind you into fine powder and spit you back out. And, frankly, that's how I see this game going this year. So, they... Our returning quarterback, Alex Hornibrook, after last season, he split time with then-senior Bart Houston, who was now playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then, this is the most interesting spot on this roster. They have two running backs on the Doak Walker list, neither of which were the starter last year. Oh, Doak Walker, of course, commemorates the best running back in the NCAA, but this is not uncommon for Wisconsin. For those of you who remember, the Rose Bowl year I referred to earlier with Russell Wilson, they had three running backs, two of which are in the NFL right now, John Clay and Melvin Gordon. They're just such a deep team at running back, it doesn't matter who's back there, they just are going to put out great players. Well, I don't really think John Clay is in the NFL anymore. But relevant to the point here. This year they have Chris James and Bardrick Shaw, and last year the starting running backs were... Corey Clement and and Dare, and his last name starts with an O, but I can't really pronounce it, so 
it's just an interesting thing to me that they just pull running backs out and suddenly they're on the Doak Walker Award watch list. Well, this is interesting for me because Wisconsin is not Ohio State and Michigan. They don't pull superstar recruits. They really don't. They have what they call walk-on culture. They will encourage players to earn their spot in the team. They really don't recruit that well, but they somehow always find superstars on their team. It's really something. Well, that's the same thing that Nebraska does. They they impersonate the heart of the state. They want guys from Nebraska or from Wisconsin, like both of these teams do, and then they build this foundation that Maryland is also trying to build at this point. But these teams have had it set for years. But at- see, it's different though. They don't really they don't recruit as hard as some of the other schools do. What I said before about walk on culture, it's true. They encourage walk ons. They build the foundation of the team almost around walk ons. It's a phenomenon very rarely seen in college football these days, and they still put together top ten teams. By the way, Wisconsin is number nine in the coaches poll for the preseason. Well, I find that to be interesting, and they're definitely the favorite in the Big Ten West this year. But most people have them, as always, between 9-3 and three and 11-1 and one for the year. Because and, they're going to lose to Ohio State or Michigan every time. Well, they're not even playing Ohio State this year. People have them losing to a Nebraska, Michigan this year, maybe Minnesota. I mean, it's an interesting thing with teams like this because they have so much turnover because of how many seniors they play. You're not... Sure what to expect, but whatever it is, it's going to be good. Well, of course, Wisconsin defense, as always, is laden with senior talent, and theirs is no exception. Yeah, they lost Vince Beagle and TJ Watt last year, but this year, the defensive backfield looks good. So there you go. They lose the guys up front, but the defensive backfield is experienced for this year, so there's always strengths on the defense. Also, they return both of their top receivers, and Jazz PV and Troy Fumagalli. It's just looking like a really solid team as it does every year. Well, I think Wisconsin could sneak into the college football playoff this year. I don't know how likely it is. But I just want to point this out before we wrap this up, which is Wisconsin finds a way every year. Last year, they entered the season unranked, and then they won against number 14 LSU the first game of the year at Lambeau Field. They will find a way. They always do. And I have Wisconsin winning this game 35-7 to at Camp Randall. Yeah, I can't really see the Terps playing this one close. And if you look at where my previews are, I have the Terps at 5-1 and one currently, and I see them 5-2 and two coming out of Camp Randall. I have the Terps absolutely getting smashed in this one. I'll go 45-21. to 21. Oh, just for those keeping score, I have the Terps at 4-2. and two. I will have them at 4-3 and three after this game. So before we move on to Maryland home against Indiana, Jordan and I pause the podcast and look at Wisconsin's schedule. And we had the Terps possibly at 9-3, and three, playing Wisconsin schedule, if replacing you, the Maryland-Wisconsin game. Well, keeping it Maryland-Wisconsin game, but just flipping who's the opposing team. But that Big Ten West really is not a great section this year, or last year even. It just isn't. I just think it's really unfair. But before we get into the Maryland-Indiana preview, remember to check out Wayne Terp on YouTube to see all of the Maryland football coverage. We started it off last week at Maryland Football Media Day. Then we had all of the opening from New Cole, and then we're looking to get out to the next opening practice. So check out Wayne Turp on YouTube for interviews for all things about the upcoming Maryland football season. So Jordan, a game that Maryland has really kind of, in my mind, blown since their first ever Big Ten game when they went into Indiana and won 37-15. to What are we looking at for this game? Well, as you said before this podcast, Indiana may be the closest Maryland match in the Big Ten. And it really does show. They had the same record as Maryland did last year, 6-7. and seven. And I gotta be honest, the comparison between the two is real and it is really strangely accurate. The only thing that I have to say about that is, I hope not. I really hope that Maryland does not fall into this... Indiana realm of mediocrity. It just, it's, it, the comparison is there to be made. They have the same record. They both kind of struggle because they're basketball focused schools in a football conference. It, it's just, I, I know I sound repetitive, but it's just really baffling how similar these two programs are. I mean, last year this definitely had to be the most disappointing game for the Terps losing 42 to 36 in Bloomington with a chance late, but Perry Hills just could not move the ball in the last position of the game. The Terps end up losing. 
And really, they were just, frankly, run over. Well, I just want to throw this out there. That may have also been the closest game in the Big Ten. But yeah, the Terps really just... I remember watching this game and thinking Maryland's going to pull away at some point, but they just could not get the wheels really spinning, and they could not make a stop on defense when it mattered. No, they couldn't stop Divine Redding, Tyler Natty, or Xander DeMont. Indiana had 414 rushing yards last year. That is truly amazing. That is... I, I can't get over that. That's a huge number. And when you put it with passing yards, they hit almost 700 yards of offense. That is crazy. I mean, most games, you want to hold the opposing team to 400 yards of offense, period. They had that much on the ground. So that was last year's story, but looking at this year, I see Indiana's returning, Richard Luego at quarterback. He had a rough year last year, 19 touchdowns, 17 interceptions. At running back, they're returning Tyler Nutty, and then wide receiver might be the Hoosiers' best offensive position this year. Yeah, they got Nick Westbrook and Simeon Cobbs. Both had over 400 yards last year. And Donovan Hale is a really high upside player who didn't have the best year last year, but people think has a lot of talent. Indiana's main theme, despite the fact that their coach was let go, is continuity. They just have so much returning from last year that they really could see a big improvement. Well, the only place that I don't see a lot of continuity is at the offensive line where they lost their old line coach to Michigan and their first and first team Big Ten guard to the NFL. He was ended up being drafted in the third round. Yeah, that's really the only weak spot. Hopefully, Maryland can expose that because honestly, their defense is continuity is just the name of the game. Their defensive coordinator Tom Allen was promoted to head coach last season, and they just again loaded with continuity. Nine returning starters on defense. That's gonna be tough for the Terps. And really, I just see it. If Maryland can run the ball, they can win this game. It's just, where will the production from the Terps quarterback position factor into a game like this? Because last year, Perry Hills didn't have the best game, even though the Terps were able to run the ball for 269 yards. Perry really just didn't make the big plays to do the passing game. They're going to have to look to do that this year to win this game. Well, that's going to be tough because defensive backfield for Indiana may be their best defensive position. They have every starter returning, including second team all Big Ten corner, Richard Fount. They... They look like the better version of Maryland to me. They have continuity, and if they beat Maryland, which I'm not saying they will, I think Maryland will win, but if they beat Maryland, they will have an 8-4 season, which may be as good as they can hope for, realistically. I mean, you're talking about another team that just has an obviously easier schedule than Maryland. Indiana's crossover games are Illinois and Purdue. Maryland has to play Minnesota Northwestern. I mean, this is just, at this point, I know the Terps have the hardest schedule in the nation, but... It's just really hard to compare them to other teams because of how hard Maryland's schedule is. Well, I think Indiana's a little bit better than Maryland, but it does, they're very evenly matched, and Maryland's looking at being maybe 4-8, and eight, and Maryland, Indiana's looking at maybe being 8-4. and four. It's just, it's, Mason's right, it's just not really fair to the Terps that they have to play the schedule, but it is what it is, and we have to deal with it. This game is going to be all about Maryland's defense. I mean, if you can stop, if you can... Stop a team from rushing for 400-something yards, you're going to be able to beat them. You were close last year with giving up the 400 yards on the ground. But this year, you got to step it up on the D-line. We've said this before. Maryland's very experienced across the defensive line. And it's just going to be about who's going to win the trenches in this game. I agree with you. Indiana, again, has that experience. They have a really good defense I have to say Maryland's defense has to win this game. They have to be able to stop Indiana and hold them back, especially in the rushing attack. This is a real swing game for me. I'm not sure who I have to win, so Mason, I'm going to buy myself some time. What do you think? Well, I got the Terps in this one. I just think it all boils down to Maryland Stadium on a Saturday. This is the game for the Terps, in my mind, where it's either you're going to have a season above expectations or a season at what I expected as my lowest, which was around 6-6. Six and six. But I got the Terps winning this game. I'm going to have them really late, almost in a comeback-style game. I think they start off slow and really pick it up at the end and win this game 38-35. And that makes them bull eligible at 6-2. and two. Well, I made a mistake earlier. I actually have the Terps at 3-4, and four, not 4-3. and three. And this is a game Maryland has to, has to, has to win, in my prediction. It, uh, this is hard. Because for me, it lines up as Indiana's less talented but more experienced seniors versus Maryland's more talented freshmen. 
But again, the well, not- the, the more talent is not only freshmen anymore; it's also the sophomores. That's fair, but it's experience versus talent in my mind. And for me, experience almost always wins. But oh my god, this is a tough game for me. I'm going to have the Terps winning 28-27. But I want to make this clear. I I think I I would call this a draw if I could. I don't know who's going to win this game, but I really want the Terps to win. So I'm going to say they will in a nail biter. Again, in a comeback like Mason. Well, before we get into our Maryland NFL preseason guidebook, remember to listen to Bruce Saturday mornings 9 a.m. on the Sports Maven. 1300 CBS Sports Radio in Baltimore or on the Radio.com app. And remember to listen to the Turp Talk Radio Show 6 p.m. Wednesday nights, 1300 CBS Sports Radio or on the Radio.com app. Here on the Young Turp Turp Talk podcast, we're now going to dive into all the Maryland players on preseason rosters in the NFL, sorted by veterans that have been on rosters and have been playing for a long time, Guys that have bounced around the league, and then the rookies, or as Jordan likes to call them, the fringe players, trying to make it onto a roster for the first time. We're going to start off with guys that have been in the league the longest, and so the longest tenured player in the NFL from the Terps is tight end Vernon Davis. Vernon Davis started his NFL career off really, really well in San Francisco. He has now moved on to the Redskins after a short Super Bowl stint in Denver, and he's really revigorated in Washington. Yeah, he, towards the end of his long San Francisco career where he was a sixth pick of the draft, he's kind of tempered off, but the Redskins re-signed him on a one-year contract last season, and he performed big time. He had his best season in four years and put up 583 yards in the absence of Jordan Reed to injury most of the season, or at least a good chunk of it. And even when Jordan Reed was on the field, Vernon Davis performed. Yeah, he's always been a big red zone threat in the NFL, and this just... He looked like his career was over, honestly, after the 2015 year with San Francisco and then being traded to Denver for their playoff run. He didn't really produce anything. Yeah, he really struggled, but the Redskins have utilized him well, and I think that will continue into the season. He's getting older, but the Redskins don't really mind that because he's still performing. So as long as he puts up the numbers and keeps playing well, he'll be on the roster. Or it's not even the Redskins roster. I mean, the tight end has become such a big position since Vernon Davis really entered the league in 2006. Now, for these veteran tight ends, you can go and be the second guy. And before, a few years ago, I mean, who's ever heard of a second tight end on an NFL roster performing the way that guys like Vernon Davis do now? Well, the Redskins really utilize tight ends efficiently and well, especially since Jordan Reed's such a big threat. So I think the Redskins are a good place for Vernon Davis to group a Redskins fan, and I think it's just a good fit for him. So the second longest tenured Maryland player in the league, is a long snapper. Yeah, it's John Kondo of the Oakland Raiders. He has been in the league for 11 seasons. He's just really the guy who you look to be the study turf in the NFL. He plays at such a specific position in the long snapper where you don't really need... There's no aging for a long snapper. I mean, it's a really hard job to do, especially at the pro level, and... If you didn't know, the long snapper is the guy who snaps the ball to the punters and kickers. And the Raiders actually have probably the two best players of kickers in the league in Sebastian Janikowski and Marquette King. So he's part of a great unit there, and don't expect him to move anytime soon. Yeah, and moving on in this list. Next is Nick Novak, the Terps' all-time leading scorer. So Nick Novak has definitely bounced around the league a lot. This is 10 years in the league. He played for the Redskins, I know, that revitalized his career in 2006, and since then, he's just really been a lot of places. Yeah, he started off his career in 2005 with the Arizona Cardinals, then went to the Redskins for two years, then was not on a team in 2007, came back in 2008 for the Chiefs, then he went to the Chargers from 2011 to 2014, and he's found a home for the Houston Texans these past two seasons. Yeah, and he really shouldn't we shouldn't see him move this offseason. He should stay with the Texans. I feel like he's had a good run there, and it should continue. The next guy was a top 10 pick to the Oakland Raiders. And, well, he's considered a draft bust now, but he's found a home in Pittsburgh. Darius Hayward Bay has certainly had a rough run of it. I remember, I think 2008 or nine, he had a huge injury in Oakland where he ran to the end zone wall and was laying on the field motionless for 10 minutes before he was carted off. And he just, 
hasn't been the weapon they hoped he would be. They picked him over Michael Crabtree back in 2008 and nine, actually, and he just kind of didn't really work out there. Well, he comes seems to come in in random spots and make big plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers, which I'm sure all you Ravens fans love. And he started off his career in Oakland. His best season was 2011 for the Raiders, where he had 975 yards and four touchdowns. Yeah, and that he hasn't had broken 1,000 yards yet. It doesn't look like he will, but Mason's right. He's played well for the Steelers the last few seasons, and hopefully that continues. He signed a new contract in the offseason, so I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, that's just kind of how his career has went. He's just a guy that comes in in these seemingly big spots, especially with the Steelers' recent receiver troubles with suspension and injury. He's been able to be an impact player in just odd times. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So if we continue with receivers, next up is Torrey Smith, who now plays for the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, Torrey Smith, I'm sure another player that the Ravens fans feel that they should have kept. He really went to San Francisco and got paid a lot and really didn't do a lot. And now he has found a new home with the Philadelphia Eagles, where he looks to put up big numbers on a team that's looking pretty good this year. Yeah, the Eagles are really trying to build it around Carson Wentz, and they signed two big receivers in Alshon Jeffrey and Torrey Smith trying to open up the field for him. And I think Carson Wentz has a great arm and good deep reads, and I think Torrey Smith will excel under his leadership. I mean, he had his best year in 2013 with the Ravens, where he had 1,128 yards and four touchdowns. And then the next year, he had 11 touchdowns for the Ravens, and then he got a big contract in San Francisco, where he really didn't do much. He had... 33 receptions for 663 yards his first year, and then really took a downturn last season, only getting 267 yards. I remember I picked my fantasy draft as a sleeper, a sleeper quote last year, and uh, yeah, kind of cut him a few weeks later. He just didn't fit in with the scheme last season. I actually think under Kyle Shanahan, he might fit in, might have fit in better, but they released him, so that ship has sailed. I think he'll play well with the Eagles. I don't know if he'll be able to regain his Baltimore form, but next to Alshon Jeffrey in the Eagles receiving core, I think he'll do well. See, that's what my opinion with yours differs. I think he's going to really pick it up again. I think he just didn't belong on a West Coast offense team. He's not a short pass guy. He's a he's a big play guy, and the Eagles are looking to make those plays, especially with Wentz and other receivers like Alshon Jeffrey. So he's going to get a lot of chances to run the deep routes that he did in San Francisco and really be a big impact guy for the Philadelphia Eagles this year. Well, something before we move on to Stephon Diggs, something that really will benefit him this offseason, I mean this season, is that he's not going to be the number one guy. He's going to be the number two guy. A lot of the attention is going to be on Alshon Jeffrey, so I think he'll be able to get off easier on a lot of the second cornerback assignments. Well, the next guy is another guy that the Ravens wish they drafted and the Redskins and basically every team in the NFL. That's Stephon Diggs of the Minnesota Vikings. Stefan has done what we all hoped he would do. He's had really good opening seasons, getting seven, around 700, 900 yards, and we expect him to really ramp it up in this next season. He's supposed to be the number one guy for the Vikings, and I think he'll break 1,000 yards this season. So do I, but, I mean, he's been a, just a really surprising guy for a lot of people, but I don't think he's a really surprising guy they succeeded in the NFL for any Maryland fans. Well, he was only picked in the fifth round, which we were all surprised by. So it's not overly surprising to know people are surprised. But I do see what you're saying in that if you watched him like we did, it's not surprising at all that he has succeeded so well in the NFL. Yeah, he's just, he's done really a lot of good things, especially for the Vikings, because they had a weak receiving core before they picked him. And then out of nowhere, they had Stephon Diggs, who was able to produce 700 and 900 yard seasons, especially last year, because they had a lot of problems with the quarterback position, and this year they're looking to regain Teddy Bridgewater, a study quarterback. So it's going to be interesting to see Stefan with a set quarterback in there. Well, there's a lot of questions for the Vikings, especially with the running back position now that Adrian Pearson's gone, and also Stefan Diggs' young receiving buddy Alex Thelen is has some injury issues as well. So they really don't know what's going on in the offense, so we're hoping Stefan gets a big role in the wake of all that confusion. Yeah, well... I mean, he's probably going to have his quarterback back, but they're also looking to play Sam Bradford. That it was my bad that I said that Teddy Bridgewater's definitely in there because they do have a little competition between Bridgewater and Bradford. So now we get to some younger chirps that are on that we know are going to be in rosters, but they're not they're not veterans. The first is Yaki Ngakwe, who I will be honest, I was really surprised with the season he had last season. I mean, he 
had a ton of sacks his last year at Maryland. He uh, comes up with eight sacks for the Jacksonville Jaguars last season. And really, they like to call him the forced fumble master down in Jacksonville. They're looking to build basically a whole new team, and Yannick Ngakwe is a good piece to start with. Yeah, he really is. They had a great draft last season despite their record, most of that in defense, and Yannick Ngakwe was certainly part of that haul. And he has been the big play machine that they've hoped he would turn into. I mean, I saw the other night on their Twitter that Ngakwe got a sack, and they said, well, that's going to start off our year because Yannick Ngakwe is back after his first sack, which was in the game against the Patriots the other night. Well, that kind of says it all. Yakin Gakwe looks to improve, and I think he will. He's getting a bigger role this season. So to round out our established players list is Sean Davis of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Who played in every game in his rookie year, but he was meant to be a special teamer when they took him in the second round, which was a surprise to most Maryland fans. If you remember, Sean Davis started his season off as a safety where he is now in the NFL, but then Randy Etzel decided to move him down to the cornerback position. But now he's back at safety for the Pittsburgh Steelers, where he played in every game and ended up having to take up a starting role due to injury late in this season. Well, he got one interception, and he had 70 tackles, which is great for a rookie safety. And again, it's just a guy who's looking to build on his rookie season. Now, unfortunately, he may actually kind of different production because they kind of revitalized their secondary after injuries last season. But he definitely will still have a role. Uh, well, he was able to produce in a really troubled secondary for the Pittsburgh Steelers last season, and I think that's going to lead to a lot of good things for his career. I mean, there's not much to say as of right now. A lot of these rookies are looking at their second year. That's a big judgment year for them, especially at the defensive back position. Well, that kind of wraps up our surefire roster makes. Now we get to some guys who have bounced around the league a little bit but should be in a roster next season, starting with Redskin A.J. Francis. Well... On our list, we have him as two years pro with parentheses five. The two years stand for two years that he's been on NFL rosters, and the five years are years that he's been on practice squad. So, yeah, it's kind of weird because he has been on, he's been on Maryland for five years, but three of those years were just in practice squads, so they technically don't count towards his NFL experience. So, officially, he's a two-year player. We all know he's actually much older. Well, the other night, if you were watching the Redskins-Ravens game, that I assume a lot of people that listen to this podcast were. You saw A.J. Francis had a big tackle for loss in the third quarter of that game, which is one of the few plays that I got to look at, and it was nice to see a guy with a huge Maryland tattoo on the back of his arm making a big play in that game. Oh, if you were watching the game, it was kind of hard to miss. It's bright red, and it's the new logo. So he's definitely a Maryland guy through and through. He grew up a Redskins fan, and I know he's thrilled to be on the team, and he really could make it this season. The Redskins are kind of thin at defensive line. He's also a veteran guy who's looking to make an impact. I mean, he's been on the Dolphins a few seasons, and he actually, his biggest news story that's come out of him since he's left Maryland is that he was actually driving Uber in the off season. <laughs> well, these practice squad guys don't make much. I didn't know he was driving Uber, though. Imagine if that, you got picked up by AJ Francis. But yeah, I think he has a good chance to make the roster. The Redskins are need some help at the defensive line, and he's 27 years old, he's got some bulk to him, and I think he's got the potential to actually make an impact. Moving on to another D-lineman that's won a Super Bowl, it's Joe Villano, who was actually one of my favorite Terps in the Randy Etzel years. Uh, Joe Villano, I always get to remember him for making the interception against the Miami Hurricanes on the debut of Maryland Pride, and he has actually had a pretty good NFL career to one of my great surprises. No offense to him, but I just didn't see it happening. But he has really played well. Yeah, he started off with the Patriots, won that Super Bowl in 2015. And then now he's on the Atlanta Falcons, and I, I guess they looked to uh, harness that Joe Villano magic last <laughs> season, winning the Super Bowl every time he gets signed. But, you know, it worked for three quarters. So Joe Villano was actually cut by the Patriots in the offseason a couple years ago, signed to the Falcons practice squad last season, and then bumped up to the active roster late in the year. And he has been re-signed. He's on the roster now. I think he'll make it. Do you, Mason? Well, I definitely think he has a good potential to make it, or at least make a practice squad. It's one of these guys who you're like, he might make the roster of the team that he's on right now, but if he doesn't, he's definitely going to make somebody's practice squad. That's always something. So next up, Dexter McDougal, who is still in the league, to some people's surprise, despite his injury issues. But I think he's got the potential to make it. He's a really athletic guy, but it's make or break time for him. I mean, he had a ton of interceptions his last season in Maryland, but then it was cut short by injuries. I believe he actually had an interception per game that year. And then 
The same has happened for the Jets where he missed the 2014 season. And then in 2015, he actually got into 14 games. And 2016, he only played in six. Yeah, injury issues are a thing. And I really feel bad for him because I think he has talent to make the league. But he keeps getting hurt. I think he still has it. Really, he's been a good guy to play one-on-one against a wide receiver and end up with an interception. That's been his thing. But it's make or break time for Dexter McDougal in the league. I definitely think he'll be on the Jets roster this season. But it might be his last year in the NFL. Well, hopefully not. The Jets are notoriously thin this season. They look kind of weak. So he may get a chance to play as they try to figure out who they want to keep in the rebuild. So if he can stay healthy and stay in the field, he may have a real shot. And we're going back to the defensive line. It is the nose tackle, Darius Kilgo. Darius Kilgo played his first two years with the Denver Broncos, played limited spots, but played well when he did, and now has moved on to New England Patriots. So the Patriots are starting to get a little bit of a medal collection going, and they're not even done with the Terps on the Patriots yet. In his first two years in Denver, he's played about half the games. He got in a little bit when they had some injuries up front. But I think he's got a lot of talent. He was drafted in the sixth round by Denver. And I feel like he's going to be one of those guys that just shows up big on the Patriots and stays there for a long time. Well, I see it differently. I think he's just going to be a rotation player, which is enough as if you're a defensive lineman. He's a big guy. He can fill up space really well. And he's not too slow either for his size, which makes him a valuable asset to have. That's basically it for, I mean, Darius Kilgo, there's not a ton on him. He's a D lineman, and really that factors into a lot of what system you're running on defense if he's going to make that roster. But if he doesn't, I definitely think he'll be on a roster this year, not a practice squad. He'll make somewhat useful roster. And that's always good news to hear. So last on this list is someone who had almost his entire rookie season taken away by injury, Quentin Jefferson. Yeah, he's on the Seattle Seahawks after being drafted in the, in the fifth round. And I think he's definitely going to make it this year. He only got to see three games last year, but, I mean, if you're cut short by injury in your rookie year and you were drafted in the fifth round, they're definitely going to give you a chance the next season. Oh, yeah, he's definitely making a roster this season. I think he'll I think he'll show up. I think he'll play well, and we'll see how it goes with him. He's going to take a couple years to figure out how he fits in the CDOC system. Well, a lot of guys seem to just randomly fit into that system, and a DN like Quentin Jefferson, I think, is definitely going to get a chance to play. They like rotating a lot of different D linemen in based on the situation that they're playing in. And Seattle's just known for finding random guys that step up, especially late in the draft. Yep. So last on the list are the rookies and second year players are looking to just make the league or make a practice squad. And we're going to start off here with Michael Dunn, who was a big head to really step up last year for Maryland, be the leader of the O-line. I think he fed, fit in really well to that. And he's looking just like he did when he went to Maryland. He wasn't a scholarship guy. He came out of Whitman and Montgomery County and really made his name on the Terps. Now he's looking to do that in the NFL. Michael Dunn, number 76 for the Terps, really filled in. He was a great guy to have last season. He was a captain of the O-line. And he really just fit in where the Terps needed him to. And that's a skill that cannot be said enough about in the NFL. Well, if you're looking for this guy to make a roster, I mean, there aren't really stats on offensive linemen, so it's going to be all about what the Rams' offensive coaches and O-line coach think about him as a character guy and the way that he fits into their system. Well, the current OC, not OC, the head coach for the Rams is former Redskins OC Sean McVay, and he, last season, did a great job of mixing and matching the O-line for situations when the teams got injured. So with that said, Michael Dunn being so versatile... Will be a he'll probably make the roster at least a practice squad on the Rams I think. Well, if it's not the Rams, it's probably gonna be somewhere somebody else because these old linemen just get seem to get almost the most opportunities out of every position in the NFL with practice squads. Well, you can never have too many old linemen. Next up is a bit of a surprise for Maryland fans out there: Trey Edmonds for the New Orleans Saints. Yeah, last year's season was cut short by injury, but before that, he was doing really well for the Terps as a power guy. That spot after he was injured was filled by Kenneth Goins, but the New Orleans Saints have given him a chance where he got one carry in their first preseason game for two yards. Well, the Saints are obviously going to have Adrian Peterson be the starter for them, along with Mark Ingram, so he's definitely not going to start, and to be honest, I don't know if he's going to make the roster or practice squad, but I think there's a league out there for him. I'm thinking he might fit well in the CFL. Yeah, so do I. I don't really think there's that much opportunity for him in the NFL, but I think he's good enough to make some kind of football league. Well, that's kind of all we can say about him. Next up is a player who was on the Dolphins practice squad last season, A.J. Hendy. 
Yeah, A.J. Handy, if you remember, was number 19 for the Terps and really seemed like he was on Maryland's team forever. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. He just he stayed on the roster. He played all four years. And he, I think he can make it with the Dolphins. He's a versatile safety, and they're having some injury issues, as we all know, in Miami. So I think the potential is there for him to make the roster this season. I definitely think there is because he was in their system last year on the practice squad. And for guys like this, it's really easy if you're a safety to play your first year on the practice squad then make the roster because you're adding to the body type that the team wants because safety really varies by team of what they want out of the free safety position, which is what Hendy plays. So next up is a Terp that also seemed to be on the team for a while, Alvin Hill, who was famously paired as number 27 with will likely seemingly forever. Yeah, he had a big freshman year for the Terps, but after that, I mean, he had a good sophomore season, but then he was really plagued by injury going late into his career, and in my mind, I just re- think that he like kind of disappeared after his first two years in the Maryland jersey. Yeah, unfortunately, true, he just had injury issues throughout his career at Maryland, and now with the Browns, he hopes to make the team. I see him as a practice squad guy. Yeah, so do I. He didn't have any stats from their game the other night against the New Orleans Saints, but I think he's got enough upside for them to give him a spot on the practice squad because everybody knows the Cleveland Browns always need help everywhere. When the Browns are kind of going under a seemingly successful rebuild so far, we'll see how it goes. Um, next up is a receiver who, wow, these guys just seem to be playing for Maryland for a long time, Lever Jacobs, plays for the Redskins, who did not record a single stat in their game against the Ravens. I was really surprised when Lever and Jacobs got the call from the NFL. I yeah. mean... You see him everywhere, though, if you follow any of, like, Comcast Sportsnet on Snapchat. It's always Lever Jacobs just always seems to be in there. He seems to be a great character guy on the Redskins preseason squad. Well, the issue with him and the Redskins, I'd love him to be a Redskin. I really would. I, I, the, Red, the Redskins' best position may be receiver. So it, I see it being very hard for him to make the roster with so much talent at the receiving spot. But I think he may be the practice squad somewhere. Yeah, or I think he's going to succeed in the CFL. He has so much speed and athleticism, which never really got to showcase in Maryland. He seemed to be injured. I mean, his brother's looking to make a big impact this year. Those two really started off strong, but kind of faded away in their later years at Maryland. But Lieberman's getting a chance in the NFL, which is really all you can ask for out of a college football player. Yep, that really is. <clears throat> so next up, another receiver who I'm – very surprised to see on this list, is Marcus Leak for the Houston Texans. Yeah, he started off his um, NFL career with the Indianapolis Colts, and then he just kind of disappeared for a little while. Then he popped up on the Houston Texans. And if you remember, he started off his career at Maryland, then left Maryland for family reasons, then came back to Maryland, and then left before he graduated. So he's been bouncing around a lot since he left high school. So he's looking to bounce around a lot in the NFL. He became active on the Indianapolis Colts for a game last year. Oh, that's at least something. So next up is the most interesting player on this list, and actually the last player on this list, Will Likely for the New England Patriots. Well, Will Likely, after the draft, I actually expected him to be drafted. He was coming off an ACL tear that cut his senior season short. And if he didn't get that tear, realistically, we would have seen him probably go in the fifth or sixth round, but he got hurt, and that just kind of buried his chances of being drafted. But you're talking about a guy that had great speed, and at the end of his Maryland career, really turned into a wide receiver running back type, and that's why I see him popping up for the New England Patriots. Oh yeah, he fits the profile, similar to Chris Hogan, very well of a player that will show up in a big game and just rack up the yards. He's so fast, he's so elusive. I see him playing wing back position for the Patriots. Yeah, I think he would be a really good passing back punt returner. But when you're talking about a guy like Chris Hogan, that's a guy that really cemented himself last year. I mean, he had multiple games that were really good. I see likely to just pop up in a random playoff game. I know all you Ravens fans are going to love this, but pop up and just destroy the other team because they've never seen him before. Yeah, it's very possible, and he fits the profile well. And that's all the players that are on the NFL rosters right now. We'll post the full list at com if you want to do more research, and that'll do it for us. We will also post the link to players sorted by college name, first letters, on ESPN.com, where you can just scroll down to Maryland, and it gives you the full list of Maryland players in the NFL. Yep, it's a really cool tool that we found to help us make this, and that would do it for us. That's going to do it for this week's Young Terp, Terp Talk podcast presented by Viner Consulting. Remember, for all of your IT solutions, check out one Viner.
V-I-E-N-E-R.com. And that's going to do it for this week's Terp Talk podcast. Remember to check out TerpTalk.com for links to all things going on in Maryland and all things going on in the Terp Talk network. That's going to do it for us this week on the Terp Talk podcast. Remember to check back next week, and thanks for listening.